myself at the beginning. My name is Lisa Burris. I'm an assistant professor at The Ohio State University. Um, and I want to present to you some work that we've been doing understanding curing. It's a nice follow-on from Eric's presentation because we're going to talk about a little bit about how the current specs that we've applied to CSA may not be relevant uh, for some of its curing properties, specs and methods. So uh, the idea for this work came from some anecdotal observations that I had while I was working at Georgia Tech with Kim Curtis on our ACM project. At Georgia Tech, the um, fog room is about a 15 minute distance of travel from our main chemistry based lab. Uh, and I got a little bit lazy and decided I didn't want to go back and forth every single day and waste the time traveling. And so I decided to pond some CSA cubes in uh, a lime water solution as is standard for most Portland cements. And seven days later, came back to something completely different. The water had not only changed in color, but had gelled. It was like a, a not quite set up jello mix, um, like thick and kind of squishy and very strange. And uh, so that was a little disconcerting. It was also accompanied by about a 20% loss in compressive strength, um, which I mean, it's a big deal if you're, if you're looking to meet strengths in the field. And so um, when I got to Ohio State, I decided I wanted to do a little bit more investigation into this, see if it was just something anecdotal that happened once or if we um, could repeat it and maybe figure out a little bit of what's going on. Uh, so before we go any further, let's talk again about the OPC versus CSA hydration process because this goes into some of the hypotheses behind this work. So with OPC, uh, we primarily are hydrating C3S and also some C2S. With water, we're forming calcium silicate hydrate and calcium hydroxide. That calcium hydroxide is the reason for using lime water in our water baths. We're trying to make sure that the highly dissolvable calcium hydroxide does not dissolve out into the water and leave open porosity within the concrete. This results in some strength loss if you pond your samples in non-lime water solution in OPC. We don't have nearly as much calcium hydroxide forming in our CSA system, though. Um, our hydration at early ages is primarily from yellamite. So yellamite and anhydrite are dissolving into water. They're forming ettringite and aluminum hydroxide. Uh, and then we do have the B-light reaction happening in our system, but usually not until much later time. Uh, and so our initial hypothesis was that we don't need to use lime water because it's not a hydration product, and so it's not supporting anything within our um, at least early age uh, CSA system. In addition, uh, while we were looking at curing, we thought, well, let's check on uh, the curing rate of the CSA and see if standard curing uh, specification requirements are necessary. Um, you can see a couple different DOT requirements here. Most require seven days moist curing in the field. Uh, some are de Florida and Texas, which are hotter and things hydrate faster, uh, have a little bit of a depression in that. Um, but we wanted to know if this is necessary. If CSA hydrates so much more quickly uh, than OPC, then we might not need to cure it for seven days in the field. And that can save us money and that can save us time. Um, and so you can see some of the hydration curves there. We actually achieve about 70% of our 28-day strength within the first day with CSA mixes. Um, compare that to OPC, which uh, takes a much longer time period to achieve. So our hypotheses were that CSA uh, only requires reduced curing periods relative to OPC, uh, that it wouldn't benefit from curing in lime water or even or DI water. I thought that that would actually be a worst case scenario. Uh, and then I wondered if perhaps we could actually improve our overall hydration and property development through use of a uh, curing solution that was more fit to the hydration products present in our CSA. So something with sulfate or something with uh, aluminate or alumina. Um, so we tested, we tracked changes in hydration and phase development, primarily using TGA. We also looked at compressive strengths and uh, drying shrinkage in the samples. Uh, we primarily used mortars, uh, two-inch mortar cubes, and some a uh, little bit larger shrinkage beams. And um, these were uh, using also a small amount of retarder so that we could get the mixing done. Uh, we have two different testing schemes. One looked at curing durations, and so we cured for one, two, three, seven, 28, and 90 days and tracked changes um, after we moved them from the 100% relative humidity curing room into a 50 per, approximately 50% humidity lab. Uh, we also looked at the effect of a myriad of curing solutions. So deionized water, which I theorized to be the worst case scenario, promoting dissolution of any hydrates, uh, calcium hydroxide solution, which is our lime water, calcium sulfate, which I hope would kind of push our hydration forward a little bit more, and then some aluminate, uh, alumina systems, aluminosulfate and aluminum nitrate. 
All right, so first let's talk about curing duration results. Um, so I, what I'm showing is, uh, TG, this is a, essentially like a bound water type of measurement. Um, we're assessing the area under the differential curve uh, in the regions that is known to, um, to, to break down uh, etringite and monosulfate, the AFT and AFM shown here in the rightmost image. Um, and so, and then we also tracked changes in the peak that's associated with aluminum hydroxide. Uh, and what we saw was if we hydrated for more than one day, we had essentially the same aluminum hydroxide results, a little bit lower if we only hydrated the system for one day, so we essentially removed them from the curing room at demolding. Um, but with our aluminosulfate phases, um, etringite and monosulfate, we see a direct correlation between curing time and the amount of phase formation occurring in the system. So uh, highest number of phases or quantity of phases relative to the longest curing period. That, however, did not translate to compressive strength development. Um, so you can see this chart here. Uh, we have OPC. Uh, as a, just a relative strength development, and then our one-day curing. And if we cured for more than one day, we essentially achieved approximately the same strengths uh, at 90 days. Uh, the other thing that I would like to point out about here, so there are some circles on the chart that shows where they were removed from curing. Uh, and all of the samples continued to hydrate even though they were in a 50% relative humidity area. I believe that's the bee light continuing to hydrate and react over time. And so even though we didn't supply additional, lots of additional moisture um, after removal from the 100% relative humidity room, it did continue to gain strength over time. Uh, and all of the mixes ended up approximately the same strength, uh, suggesting we may only need two days worth of curing in order to optimize our strength development in CSA system. We also looked at the effect on drying shrinkage, uh, and what we see is first, uh, OPC is at the bottom here, and so even when we only cured for one day, we about halved our shrinkage in the CSA system, so it's doing much better as far as drying shrinkage goes, and the longer we cured, the better our shrinkage results were, the, the less shrinkage that we had. Uh, we did get some shrinkage upon removing from the curing room regardless of the, the curing duration, so even at 90 days, we have a little bit of shrinkage as our samples dry out, which makes sense. Um, but we're still getting a lot better shrinkage performance. Okay, so let's talk about those alternative curing solution results now, which I think are a little more exciting. As a reminder, we looked at DI water, lime water, calcium sulfate, and aluminum sulfate, and aluminum nitrate. As far as hydration goes, we didn't really see much difference between any of the samples, uh, with the exception of a slightly lower aluminum hydroxide content with the aluminum sulfate solution. We see a pretty big difference in compressive strengths, however. Um, so first, take a look at the red lines. Those are the aluminum solutions. Unfortunately, we were not able to find an aluminum solution that was not acidic. So uh, the aluminum nitrate, which we started out with, has a pH of about three. And as you might guess from exposing a sample after one day of curing to a really acidic solution, uh, we had a lot of strength loss from that. It broke down the microstructure, and uh, we ended up with really low strengths, about 10 megapascals at the end of time. Uh, the aluminum sulfate is a little bit higher pH. It's about pH 5, um, and that did better. We didn't completely kill our strengths. We got about 30 megapascals at 90 days. Uh, but everything else did a lot better. So if you're going to cure in solution, don't use an aluminum solution. It didn't seem to help hydration like I had theorized, um, and it didn't help our strengths either. Uh, but uh, looking at lime water, that actually performs worse than the other two systems investigated. So the DI water, which I had theorized would be most likely to dissolve components, um, actually did not harm the system as much as the presence of lime water. I'm not entirely sure why, uh, but uh, we see lime water and the uh, calcium sulfate saturated solution generated the highest strengths out of this set of, of materials. Uh, we see a little bit different results with the shrinkage measurements. Um, so both of the calcium bearing solutions generated the highest amount of expansion in the system, uh, and all of our samples expanded at least until removed from solution uh, and had very very, uh, had almost no shrinkage, no measurable shrinkage, um, about for 56 days after removal from that curing solution. Uh, so putting your samples in a ponded water bath does optimize your shrinkage effects, um, even after removal from solution. And the calcium solutions seem to help the most. 
Uh, finally, the most exciting thing I think is comparing though, uh, curing your samples in a fog room versus ponding them in solution. Uh, and what we saw was a major strength drop uh, whenever we ponded our, our samples in a water bath. Um, so even using the best performing system, the DI water and the calcium sulfate solution, we saw about an 18% reduction in strength at 90 days. Uh, and when we used lime water, we saw a 36% loss of strength uh, in our samples. So, uh, this makes me question whether we should allow water bath curing for CSA samples when we're taking them back to our lab to, to test strengths of, of things that are going on in the field. Uh, because it's, it's not representative of the strength that is forming in the field because of some dissolution that's happening in those systems. So conclusions, hypothesis one was CSA will require uh, less, curing, less extensive curing. Uh, and that is true. Um, it looks like we really don't need more than two or three days to optimize the sh uh, shrinkage and compressive strength development in our system. And then as far as the curing solutions go, uh, we are not benefiting from curing our samples in lime water, and that is a questionable practice in, in my opinion. Uh, we also didn't get anything really from using alternative curing solutions like calcium sulfate or aluminum solutions, so we don't even need to keep considering those. Uh, wasn't helpful. Uh, and so my suggestion is, as far as uh, moving forward with standards, uh, that we should alter our standards to uh, accept the different performance metrics of the CSA cement concrete uh, and only, allow f only require 48 hours of curing in CSA concrete systems in the field. Uh, and we also should question whether we should allow the use of curing tanks for CSA samples. I don't believe that that is a, a good choice for our CSA systems. <clears throat> 